All right, with that said, John 16. These things I have spoken to you that you may keep from stumbling. They will make you outcasts of the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering services to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But the things I have spoken to you, so that when their hour is come, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me. For he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Let's pray. God, as we continue to search your scripture, we are constantly reminded that your truth is far beyond our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. The way that you give out information is not how we would give out information. Your plans would not be in our plans. And we need to come to the scriptures with humility and understanding that, that you are God and we need to know from you. Help us learn through your word. Help us perceive the truth to see your plan fully and completely as we review all of scripture. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Galatians. We are almost done with the introduction. Fun, right? Um, The reason why Galatians introduction has taken longer than other books have taken like for example ephesians and um colossians is because there's a lot of background that needed to be addressed concerning the 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 discussion between jew and gentile um today when when a jew comes in we say what do we do with the jews the first portion of acts they were saying what do we do with the Gentiles? Now, it's a shame that those kind of questions are asked, and it's a shame that we have to kind of revisit the facts that there is within Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, neither Jew nor Greek. Um, but it is, it, it's of vital importance to kind of continue to reestablish exactly what the problem is so that we can read the book of Galatians and study it with a proper framework. In this particular lesson, we will overview the text of Galatians with two methods. First, we will outline the book, um, summarizing each section for you so that you can kind of like get a a preview of the entire book as a whole. Second, we will review key words, creating a glossary for Galatians. In fact, it's always one of the most valuable things to do if you have an individual notebook for yourselves is to kind of in the back put glossary. And if you, you know, hopefully don't run out of space because if you you start the last page, you, you may want more pages. Um, but you can go ahead and start glossary of Galatians and start putting down definitions of words um, so that you'd be able to, when you see a word that you're like, what does that mean again? You can flip back and, and grasp it a little bit better, especially as we start doing the textual evaluations, because we will get into obviously the original languages, defining the words according to the original language and not according to the translations we have in front of us. So beginning in Galatians chapter 1, we have an introduction or prologue, and I believe that just takes place between verse 1 and through all the way through verse 10. Um, as a quick reminder, an outline is whose work? Man's work. God did not create the outline. All right. 
So any outline, if you want to go ahead and say, well, actually, I think it starts, at, you know, the prologue ends at verse six. Okay. You know, if you want to create your own outline, I encourage that. The more you think about a book, the more you think about how it's broken up, the better it is for you as well. So just remember, this is my outline. This is how we're going to be studying it. If you want to use it, fantastic. If you want to create your own, even better. So the introduction prologue, one through ten. The greetings in verses 1 through 2, where he says, here I am, I'm Paul, and I'm writing to the churches of Galatia. Uh, he gives a blessing in verses 3 through 5, and simply just a, a, a general greeting. This is typical for Greek letters, typical especially for the Greek epistles in the Bible. And then automatically, if you don't, if you don't realize how upset Paul is, you know, there's, there's certain phrases we use we don't like to use in church, but he's really ticked off here, okay? And you see this at the beginning, and you see this all the way to the end. Um, typically, when Paul finishes a book, it's it's a little bit lengthy in its introduction. He basically gives like 12 words of goodbye. He's like, here's the information. Deal with it. I am so upset right now. He's mad. Throw my fist down in frustration. He gets right into their faces in verses 6 through 10, and basically saying, you have deserted Christ. Now, that's not a very nice way to start a letter. Now, he gives a, a blessing in verses 3 through 5, but then he gets right into the, the problem and the frustration that he has, probably because it wasn't long after he left before this perversion started happening within the Galatian churches. Then Paul defends his apostleship, and this is an important question we have to both ask and answer within the text, why does Paul need to defend his apostleship in verses and verses beginning in verse 11 all the way through chapter 2 verse 10? Um, number one, I'll go ahead and give you a clue right now because his apostleship is being challenged. You don't say, "Hey, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, and my message is not from Peter or James or anyone else. I got it from God and Jesus Christ Himself." Why do you need to say that if it's not being challenged? They are being challenged, he is being challenged directly, and he is going to um, refute that challenge by his testimony, in which he talks about specifically the source of his message. The source of my message is not men. This is one of the reasons why I disagree that he got the gospel from Ananias when, his, when, he, when, they, when he came to Paul and prayed for him that his eyesight would be restored and baptized him. That's not when he got the gospel. And when I say the gospel, what do I mean? I mean the entire message of the restoration or the reconciliation of mankind by God in all aspects. He was not taught that from the apostles. But he received it through Jesus Christ himself. He goes into some history, which we will go into Pauline history a little bit. We, I want to create a timeline. I will go ahead and provide that for you. I'm working on it. And I'm going to go ahead and provide it here and also in, in print so you guys can take it with you. Kind of just looking at how Paul functions. It's always interesting. And remember, that creates a more tactile function of, the, of Paul, of the characters that we're dealing with, and seeing where exactly were they and what did, were they doing at what time. Therefore, you understand greater. It's history. I was talking with someone earlier today. You know, the people oftentimes approach the Bible as a mystical book when predominantly it's a historical book. It's information, it's details, it's facts. And your response to that could be varied. Some people are very emotional over it, some people aren't. And people go, why aren't you emotional? Well, why are you? Emotions don't play a fact of it. Whether or not you take in the information and receive it as fact, that's a different question. Yes, you can have emotions to it. I've wept over scripture but over places you probably would not expect. Well, other people don't. So we're always taking in the history, understanding the tactile nature of it so that we will be able to have a better grasp over the event and not mystify the details. And then, and, and Paul's interaction with the apostles, 116b, and, I, and I, again, I broke it up a little bit more than somebody would have, through 210, where he's basically saying his interactions with Cephas, that's Peter. We'll talk about that when we get there. James, the brother of Jesus Christ, 
and John. So Peter and John, pillars, right? The other James has already been probably killed by this time. We'll find that out in Acts, I think, Acts 8 or 9. Then James and John become pillars, and James, the brother of Jesus, who's basically the, um, the leader of the synagogue of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. And these are three pillars. These are the people that are like, they really are the, the main focus of the group of the elders within the church. And he talks about how he was interacting with them. And it's like, I find this fascinating because I believe that the first um, uh, portion of, of, of Galatians 2, where he takes Titus along with him, and he went down because of Revelation, and he submitted the gospel which he preached, is not the council at Jerusalem from Acts 15. I believe it was pre previous to that. We'll talk about it, why I think that, and we'll go ahead and create that timeline using Galatians as a help to fill in the gaps of our history. He talks about how his message was not received from the apostles. The authority was not received from the apostles. He, he did not need to go down there, but he wanted to let them know exactly what he was teaching and when they saw it and when they heard it, they approved it. The apostles' approval was not necessary. And he actually says that right there. He says, it didn't matter who they are. And it didn't matter to me if I got their if there I got their approval or not. I have my instructions from Jesus Christ Himself. However, they did approve of it. And again, this is all establishing what? His authority as an apostle. Furthermore, then he defends ju the justification by grace through faith. In chapter 2, verses 11 through 21, and this is in context of a discussion, an argument, a rebuttal of Peter. And he starts out by talking about how Cephas or Peter violates the gospel. Now again, would you expect an apostle to tell people, you have to be good to go to heaven? That's not what he says. That's not what the complaint is. Can it be construed that that is the message? Yes. So by his behavior, he's compelling the Gentiles to, to reconsider something about the truth of the gospel. And then he confronts him directly to his face, verse 14. And then in verses 15 through 21, we have some difficult statements in here that we have to talk about what it means, uh, for example, that, that we are Jews by nature, not sinners amongst the Gentiles. Well, that's pretty rough. Well, I have to understand exactly what that meant. But... It, some fascinating and deep theology found in verses 15 through 21 where it talks about the law and faith. <clears throat> Point number four, Paul defends living by grace through faith, beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, all the way through 526. This is the bulk of the book. Now, if you wanted to go ahead and create point four, point five, point six as you go through here, again, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I just want to go ahead and see that um, that 3.1 through 5.26 is a continual thought process about living by grace through faith on the basis of we are, we are also justified by grace through faith. And justification concepts are not limited only to the idea of initial reconciliation to God, but your justification before God also continues in your life. How are you approved by God? in your life he begins out by asking them are you so foolish in chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 great question and again as i pointed out before sarah and i or sarah wrote it down but we both thought it we are foolish galatians when we first taught this book what 15 years ago it's been a long time we we, we had to deal with the fact that we had, were completely wrong about how to live our life as a believer. We were steeped in legalism. We thought that we had to have a checklist of things we had to do, tithing and teaching Sunday school and passing out tracts and praying before every meal and all this other stuff. And as long as we did these, these okay, I'm a good Christian, and our mind was completely warped. And we had to realize we fell into the same exact trap that the Galatians fell into, just a different type of circumcision 
But this is a vital, important concept because if you don't realize exactly what Galatians is talking about, you won't realize the problem that plagues most churches, most Christian mindsets, even amongst the Bible churches themselves, because we were part of that. We still believed we had to do certain things to be approved by God in our life as a believer. Instead of using the grace of God and what he has given us as the motivation to do things because we have been given, because we are approved. Not by works, but by grace. What does that mean in the life of the believer? Well, you are so foolish. Point number, point B within point four is, is uh, the example of Abraham in six through nine. Because Abraham, the believer, gave a, a life example, not only to the Jews that would be following, but also to the believing Gentiles who were to follow. Then there, people said, if you're going to follow the law, think that you have to follow law, you're cursed. Or like, why? Because you have to follow all of it. And if you're going to place yourself under a law, you have to follow the whole law. So you're cursed if you're going to try and try to follow and be justified by God by works. Point D is Christ redeemed us from that curse. So why go back under the curse if Christ redeemed you from the curse? And then he gets into the intent of law. Why the law then? What's the point of it? Now, this is very reminiscent, and we talked about this in Romans a long time ago. Uh, we'll have to make sure we understand the full intent of the law in all of its aspects. There is something that the intent of the law brought for the Gentile. And there was something the law had an intent for, for the Jew. So we have to understand that the, 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 the manifold purpose, very different, type, different, different reasons why the law was given, and it's not just one thing, how to live. And I would even say it was never really intended to demonstrate how, on all aspects of the law, how to live for the Gentile. An interesting concept in chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, um, this is deep. Uh, it, it, it gets a little um, complicated in chapter 4. And so we'll have to take our time, make sure we understand how Paul uses um, examples and uses it as <gasps> allegory. And this one of the people like, oh, see, you can use allegory. Yes, you can. We can allegorize anything we want. But it doesn't make it in the interpretation of the passage. Paul doesn't reinterpret Hagar and Sarah. He doesn't reinterpret slave and heir. He simply uses those examples to help us understand the purpose of the law. So in chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, slave and heir, what's the, what's the difference here and how does that function? Then he gets into Paul's plea part 1. Chapter 4, verses 12 through 20. And, and you read it, and I can, I can I read it. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. And I read this, and I almost, and again, I'm very visual when I, when I, when I deal with people. And I, and I try to put myself in the situation. And when I say this, I'm not being spiritual or mystical about it. I can almost see the teardrops on the page as he writes this. It's highly emotional. In fact, I would tell you that, that probably out of all the chapters of the books of uh, the epistles, Galatians 4, 12 through 20, impact me emotionally. I read it and I, I get kind of choked up. In chapter 4, verses 21 through 31, the allegory of Sarah and Hagar and Sinai and Jerusalem, you have these different allegories. And people read that and they go, ah, this is so confusing. And I go, ah, I know. It is confusing, um, I think, in part because we're not familiar enough with the Old Testament story to kind of like just understand what that was. We're not reinterpreting Sarah and Hagar. But if we're going to go ahead and deal with this text and understand exactly what he means by this, we're going to have to go ahead and deal with the Old Testament as well as the implications found within the allegory. What does he mean by this? Which I honestly, it's not that difficult as long as you let it stand on what he says it stands on. Then you get into chapter 5, verses 1 through 26, and within chapter 5, uh, uh, 1 through 26, um, it's 
not overly difficult, but at the same time, it can get hairy. If you've read through Galatians, you've probably stopped at Galatians 5.21 and said, what? And I'll tell you right now, even in this verse, which says, you know, all the different things, the, the deeds of the flesh, that those who practice those things will not inherit the kingdom of God, you go, well, that seems a lot like living by works, doesn't it? Great question. We'll get there. We've dealt with it in part in Ephesians. I'm not sure if you remember or not, but this is probably a lot more straightforward, and it has creates difficulties in a lot of people if they don't know some basic hermeneutics or some of the, gramma the grammatical structures that's found within this passage. So it's strictly instructions of living by grace through faith. These are how to do it. This is the how to, okay? In chapter 6, we have point 5, Paul's instruction to the Galatian churches to fix the problem. He's basically given them everything. Here's the problem outlaid. Here's my authority as an apostle. Here's with the overall main doctrines of, of justification by grace through faith. Here's some examples and some ideas about the law and how that's supposed to function. And don't do it. And uh, here's some allegories for you. All these proofs. Here's how to do it. Now, chapter 6, brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass. What's the book of Galatians about? What's the trespass he's talking about here? Is this talking about if anybody's, you know, uh, slipped up and gambled a little bit? Is it, did anybody swear? Did anybody steal something? Did anybody commit an act of immorality? Is that what they're talking about here? Is this act of trespass? Doctrine. If anyone is messed up in their doctrine, they have fallen short. They have tripped over bad doctrine. If you're caught in that, what do you do? You who are spiritual, you have to deal with that phrase, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one look into yourself so that you too will not be tempted. You who are spiritual have a responsibility to help those who are in a trespass. There's an individual responsibility in verses 4 through 10. Each one must examine, okay? Each one is to bear his own load. Wait a second. I thought we we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. Why are we bearing our own load? Different words and different understanding. Chapters, you know, verses six uh, through ten continue this idea about how we must understand that we have to be careful about our own doctrinal stability and our own mindset, and not just rely upon other people. Yes, it's one of the reasons why we do tools for Bible study. Because you should not simply rely upon your teachers. You also have a personal responsibility to read, to seek, to learn, to grow. And then you have Paul's plea part two. Not as emotional as the previous one, but he is basically ending the letter. Not with blessing. That's in verse 18. Literally, 18. Look how this is the end. That is the concluding remarks in verse 18. How many, how many words are there? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. Done. Where's where is the where is the the, the the doxology? Where is the benediction of Paul? It's not there. He is so upset that he literally just standard standard conclusion gone. But verses 11 through 17, his plea, his desire to get through and say, basically just please, please understand where we're coming from. You need to under, you need to return back to which I have previously taught to you and not be fooled by these individuals coming to you saying that you need to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses to be complete. So that's the outline. Um, if you want just the outline and not the whole page of notes, we can go ahead and I can extrapolate that out. Just ask me. I can go ahead and manipulate this all you want. Or you get the electronic version and play with it all you like. Even better, write it down yourself. Rewrite it. Make different breaks. Have different conclusions. Um, you know, if you don't like how it's worded, fix it for yourself. 
how you so that you would remember it better. Because here's what I want you to do, especially for those who are part of the Tools for Bible Study class. If you want, okay, so it's not homework. If you want, stay ahead of me. I will. You'll see where I'm going. It's pretty obvious because I'm going to go from chapter one through chapter six in order. So if you stay ahead of me and you follow the tools of practice for the Bible study, you break down the sentences, you make your observations, you rewrite your own sentences, and then you ask questions that you don't know the answers to, then as I am teaching, hopefully I answer your questions. And if I don't, come up and ask me or email me, text me, call me, however you like. But that way you're able to practice this because it's always vital to, 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 to follow along with the book of Galatians, specifically in the personal responsibility section of chapter 6. You have to take it on yourself. You can't simply rely upon those who are spiritual to constantly pull you up. You have to take on that responsibility as well. All right, that's the outline. Let's go ahead and make some general observations about the book of Galatians, and we're going to read a lot more here. So we're going to go through a lot of these concepts. Uh, first of all, I already mentioned this, that Paul fills in some gaps in the Acts timeline. Acts is kind of like broken up into um, like sections, Peter, then Paul. But there's some time, some events that we don't see in the book of Acts. Paul, in a couple of different books, specifically here in Galatians, fills in some of those gaps in the Acts timeline. In chapter 2, we will give an overview again of Paul's life and guesstimate, yes, because we don't know specifically, we will guesstimate the dates of major events, specifically giving how much time lapses between certain events within the history and Acts. There are few verbs in Galatians uh, that have an imperative mood. Uh, we'll deal with imperative, that's command, instructional. Or if you want to get into like a, a very technical term, a hortatory section. And the hortatory section begins in chapter 5, verse 1, through chapter 6, verse 18, which tells us even though there are a few imperatives in chapters 1 through 4, they're, they're kind of like, uh, a few of them are like, behold, which means look at this, which is an imperative, okay? But they're not really instructional as for what we're supposed to do with the information. He says, look at this type of thing. There is one in chapter 1, which I want to point out, that really seems to correspond with also the end of book in chapter 6, verse 17. It's tremendous bookends. So chapters 1 through 4 are doctrinal basis for the instructions found in chapters 5 through 6. Once again, in our Tools for Bible Study course, we said every instruction has a reason in the New Testament. I cannot find any instruction in the epistles that is not immediately surrounded by what the Bible says around it. Here's the reason. Here's what to do with the information. The is and the ought, as Dr. Cohn likes to say. So the ethic and the, and, uh, the, the moral and the ethic. Here's what is true. Here's what to do with it. And that we find that in the book of Galatians, very straightforward. Uh, I do want to take you uh, through a little um, trip through the imperatives. So this will be quick. Uh, we'll have them on the screen for you. If you want to try to keep up, it's very simple. Galatians 1, 2 verses. Galatians 5 through 6, many more. Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9 have an imperative here. If we speak a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be a curse. That is an imperative. It's not an indicative. Interesting. What do you mean an imperative? How am I supposed to take that instruction? Or if I'm back in the church of Galatia, how is the, per the person in Galatia, the church there, supposed to take that instruction and understand it within the context of that passage? Honestly, I, I I think I figured this one out. We'll get to that in a moment. We'll get that later. But that is that's a how is that an imperative? Hmm. And how do we how are we supposed to understand it? Galatians chapter five. Skip all the way over because the other imperatives in the other sections are either review of of the text. Uh, there's one about Hagar. 
that is uh, that it's, it's, a, it's an imperative mood, but it's not there. And the other couple are look at this or behold, you know, see to it, that type of idea. But Galatians chapter five, verse one, we have a, a, an imperative. Keep. Keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Keep, keep is an imperative and begins off right off the bat in chapter five. Okay, after I've explained this to you, after we understand the freedom that we have, understand the liberty that we have in Christ, after we see that we're not under law but under grace, keep standing firm. Chapter 5, verse 13. So now you have verses 2 through 12. There's no imperative. There's information, more doctrinal basis for why we should keep standing firm. And in verse 13, do not turn your freedom. Into the opportunity of the flesh, but through love, what? Here's the imperative. Serve one another. So keep standing firm. Next imperative, serve one another. Verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take care. Be warned, basically, that you are not consumed by one another. In contrast to serve one another, He's warning them, do not be consumed. So the, the imperative there is take care. Verse 16. But I say, what it what and what's the imperative here? Walk. Peripateo, walk by the spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. We're going to talk about this greatly because we need to understand what this is. If this this is one of the major imperatives in the book of Galatians. If we're going to live spiritual lives, if we're going to live by grace through faith, if we're going to live our life according to how God wants to live, then we need to take the, the imperative of how to live, to walk, and understand exactly what he's commanding here. Once again, I believe this has been highly and overly mystified. We can make this very practical, understandable, and useful so that when you go home, you know exactly what Scripture is instructing the people in Galatian churches to do. And therefore, we can also absorb that as instructional for us. And, and it's kind of strange because in chapter 5, you would think there'd be a lot more instructions there, but there are only these four. Chapter 6 have a lot more. Chapter 6, verse 1, we already talked about this, restore. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. What does it mean to restore them? Verse 2, bear. Bear one another's burdens and thereby, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So you're going to bear one another's burdens. Who? Who is to bear one another's burdens? The spiritual ones. Are you a spiritual one? We'll find out. Verse 4, each one must examine his own work. Examine. And actually, that word examine, I think, is a pretty not great word. It's a word you also find in James. The word is to actually demonstrate. Okay? To basically show it. Verse 6. Share. The one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Share. Share. Verse 7, do not be deceived is the next imperative. This is a great little, you know, people take this as a, as a, as a proverbial word, you know, proverbial statement. Eh, no, so much. Sure. It's, tr it's a truth, very short and quippy. But don't be deceived. Understand exactly that you, will, you are responsible for your own self. You are responsible for your own growth and stability. Take care of yourself. What you sow, you will reap and then the next imperative goes all the way down to verse 17 which i really wanted to bring out verses uh eight and nine of chapter one let him be accursed and look what it says here again from now on let no one cause trouble so they say that whole let no one cause trouble for me for i bear on my body the brand marks of jesus so basically he is relating himself to the problem in Galatians is they're causing trouble to me because I also have sacrificed for you. Again, we'll get into the grammar and some of the observations that we deal with that as well.
So those are the imperatives, the major imperatives. What do we have? I didn't count them before. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven imperatives in Galatians. Not a whole lot when you think about other ones. I think James has like 60, something like that. I can't remember exactly. A lot of imperatives in James. Romans obviously has a ton, especially beginning in, at, at, beginning in chapter 12. I think there's two between 1 and 11, but there's a lot in chapter 12 through 16. Galatians, not many. Highly doctrinal, highly um, in, in pouring out the truth of what they've been consumed with and making sure that they make corrections. And most of them do with what? Making sure that you are properly understanding the truth of God and doctrine. That's the imperatives. Now, key words in the book of Galatians. Now, I, I, I don't, I, I count every single word and I look for repetition, but I also look for other ones that are, that are more important regardless of repetition. Um, so when I go through the book of Galatians, you know, if I see a word, that I, I'm going to highlight, I highlight the word and I deal with that word, even if it's only one use <laughs> once. But there are certain words that are used repetitiously. Um, so, and there are certain words that are used repetitiously that I don't find really as key. The, you know, I'm not going to look for all the thes. Um, you look for actual key terms. The first one I want to talk about is used the most times outside of theos. Theos is the word for God. So you could emphasize the word God, but, you know, we always do. But outside of the word God, what word is used the most in the book of Galatians? If you have my notes, you can cheat. It's the word law. Um I didn't write down the amount of times it's used. I believe law is used something like 24 times in the book of Galatians. But there are two different words you want to deal with. You want to deal with the law and law. The law, that is, with an article, and law, without an article. Be careful, because sometimes in context... The lack of an article does not mean it's not specific. However, when you have the law, I would say probably most times it refers to the Mosaic law. There's one instance in Galatians that I'm thinking that the the is basically just basically referring back to the previous no article law. Basically that the what we just spoke about law. So sometimes it has to do with it or not. It's in the predicate of the sentence or if it's later on in a various different phrase. But I would say that all but one in the book of Galatians, you see the word the law, it is the dealing with the Mosaic law. However, with the law, with the law no article, and we'll have to determine exactly where that is, because most of the time it's translated with an article still. However, in my, um, in my NASB, I do have times where I have a little note, which I am actually very impressed with them on doing this, where they say... Um, Little note, or law, basically is like not the law, but or law, or case, because they didn't know what to do with it, so they just put a little note there, which I appreciate better than just putting it as the law, meaning the Mosaic law. But if you had the word law with no article, it means a system of rules determining blessing and curses. It doesn't matter which law. In fact, most people say now. That we live under a law. And by that law, we will determine blessings and curses for believers. What one law is that? Again, you'll, you'll find this almost everywhere. Love. If you don't love one another, curses. If you love one another, blessings. And then they'll pervert the idea of love as full acceptance. That's the law that we live by. Well, if you're going to put yourself under a law, James and Pete, Paul both agree. You're putting yourself under the law. Be very careful. But once again, we'll have to ex explain what it means to live by grace through faith and not under law. But uh, shortly, we don't do anything to gain benefit. I cannot do something in accordance with God's desires. We know what God's desires are. 
But we can't do what God desires in order to gain something from him, in order to have a blessing that, the, that America will rise again type of thing. Or I will have prosperity or health in my family because I was such a good Christian. That's not how we operate today. We're not under law. We're under grace. We do things. We respond by love. We would do what, as God desires because we have all blessings. Specifically dealing with law and the law, look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. In this chapter, in this portion right here, you have both the law and law. Okay? What I am saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later. It's pretty obvious which law we're talking about. We're talking about the Mosaic law, which came 430 years after Abraham. Does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, not the law based on law, any law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted to Abraham by means of a promise. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions. So then it goes back to the law. It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not only for one party, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law, see how that works? Any law had been given, which is able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. So you just got you got to make sure you understand the difference between the law and law when you're reading this kind of passage. Otherwise, you can get yourself kind of twisted up. Next glossary term is the word faith. Um, just in case you're joining us for the first time ever, you know, doctrine of God, specifically of Jesus Christ that has been believed. Um, the idea of it being believed or intended to be believed is, is captured within the term faith. But it is talking about that which is believed, content, the doctrines of God or the doctrines of Jesus Christ that have been believed. Believe is to be fully persuaded that a proclamation is true. So you're going to hear something about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. That's the faith that you're supposed to believe. You are supposed to consider that, be fully persuaded that that is true. That's believing it. So you see that one's a verb, one's a noun. To believe it or the content by what, what we believe. Galatians 2.16 and 20 says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Now, here's a great a little preview that is not in. I don't. It's not faith in the Son of God. It's actually just faith with the genitive Son of God. And I would say this. I live by faith concerning the doctrines of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The next glossary term I want to talk about is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. When, and again, um, you got to be careful. Every context needs to be determined by its own. But whenever you generally have an article in Galatians, it is talking about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. I think one time that even if it has an article, it is not necessarily referring to the Holy Spirit. But the word spirit with no article, generally speaking, now there, I think there's one time when it's, or two times it doesn't have an article, it is still within the context of the Holy Spirit of God. But you have to be very careful. You get yourself confused if you don't understand the difference between the spirit and spirit. The Holy Spirit of God or the inner life of a man, the renewed spirit of a believer. You, re, you were born again. I, I, I was not physically born again. What was born again? My spirit. 
I had a dead spirit. Well, if again, I don't want to get into the dichotomous, dichotomous idea, soul, spirit concept, right? But you were born in spirit. You were spiritually made alive. Do we also have the Holy Spirit in us? Yes, we're sealed with it. And it has other benefits that are described within the scriptures. But a lot of times when it talks about spirit, it's talking about your renewed spirit, your alive portion of yourself. And you got to be very careful how you understand that. For the longest time, I always thought that I had to feed the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? It's God. I don't understand how to, to, to feed the Holy Spirit. Does it need nourishment? No. What spirit do I need to feed? My spirit. Okay? So we'll talk about that when we get to chapter 5. Here's an example of spirit and the spirit. Galatians chapter 3, verse 2 through 3. Uh, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by spirit. Now, is that the spirit? I would say probably so. That's where I am right now. I still need to work with it a little bit. Are you now being perfected by flesh? Interesting question. When you don't see the, the article, is it referring to something in the immediate context, or is it talking about the human spirit that has been re regenerated? Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. But I say to you, walk by. Is it the spirit? It's not. Walk by spirit, you will not consider the, the desires of the flesh. For the flesh has a desire against what? Who? the Holy Spirit? My flesh has its desires against the Holy Spirit? Who's going to win that battle? Every time. So why do we sin? Because we're not dealing with the Holy Spirit here. We're dealing with my spirit. For these are in opposition to one another, that you may not do the things you please. But if you are led by spirit, if you're spiritually led, you are not under the law. Again, we'll prove all that. We'll deal with it when we get there. It's a little preview, some fun to come in a while. But a couple of final ones we will close up flesh, the outward body of a person, the personification of a person's sinful nature. So the flesh is flesh and blood did not reveal this to me. That's used in Galatians. But also the flesh strives against your spirit. What does that mean? My physical arm is battling. No, it's, it's a personification of my sinful nature. Gospel. We know this one. Well, good news. The message of salvation by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And we talked about that word salvation, which is not in the book of Galatians. No cognate, no mention of the word save, salvation, savior, anything in the book of Galatians. So why did I harp on it so much? Because that's still the context of the book in Galatians 15.1. Acts 15.1. There is no Galatians 15.1. If you have Galatians 15.1, it's a bad Bible. Throw it out. <laughs> So the message of salvation, big picture of salvation, by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Everything is by grace of God through Jesus Christ, so dealing with our redemption, our salvation, our perpetuality, our glorification in the future. Promise. A promise is an emphatic announcement, a, declar a declared truth by God, specifically dealing with the portions of or the content of the covenant of Abraham. Grace, we know the word grace very well, although I still think it needs to be defined and repeated often so that we don't get mixed up. Grace is not simply a benefit. See, they've taken the idea of grace and turned it into something you can earn. Oh, it's just a benefit. It's a good thing. No, grace by definition in its entirety is something that you cannot deserve. Once you deserve it, it's not by grace. Hey, uh, you know, I, I want you to repay you for your, you know, mowing my lawn. This is my grace gift to you for mowing my lawn. That's not a grace gift. That's payment. You worked for it. You earned it. It's not grace. You have to not deserve it. And yet it's a good benefit that is provided to someone who does not deserve it. And then finally, righteous or justify. Used a couple different times. One's a noun, one's a verb. Righteous is the noun, justifies the verb. What is proper, correct, just, and the verb would be to declare right. So a lot of times righteous, we kind of over-spiritualize this word too. It just means to be declared right or just that's what that's right. 
And who are you right in front of? If you're going to be right in front of God, then you better understand exactly what he requires for you to be right. And I'll tell you right now, it's not by works or sin avoidance. You have to be right before God by grace. He gives you his righteousness. He justifies you by faith. So if you want to get ahead of me, we will be dealing with Galatians 1 through 5, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through the agency of men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our, of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. We will deal with that passage next week. If you will, read it, take notes, observations, break it down, ask questions. And we'll see if I can answer them all next week. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much for your word that we are able to get the big picture of the book of Galatians, both in the context of the history, the overall concept of what they're dealing with, as well as just looking at Galatians from a very large overhead so that we can understand the book as a whole and then go back and dive into it, hopefully being able to understand each word as it is your word. We thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for those who are here and the blessing they are to us. Help us to be a blessing to each one of us, uh, one another. For those who are not here, we pray for them, whether they are ill in need of help or they're traveling, or uh, and, and other other needs. We pray for them and help us to show grace and mercy to them, just as you have shown grace and mercy to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.